Long before I took my first college class in psychology or philosophy, I remember spending hours in deep, if naive, conversations with close friends. My recollections are sure to be colored by nostalgia, but I remember these discussions taking place under the starlit night sky. More likely, most of those discussions took place in the dank, unfinished basement of my friend's house, with blankets hanging over the windows to shut out the midday sun and nine-inch nails in the CD player. On most occasions, we were probably stoned. The topics would range from speculations about alien life, ghost stories and urban legends, government and revolution, to debates about God and the soul, about free will and determinism, and most especially about consciousness. What stands out most for me about the phenomenon of consciousness is that it's undeniably real. Maybe there are vast civilizations of alien organisms populating other planets. Maybe the universe was created by an intelligent and purposeful being, but there is no maybe in consciousness. I definitely am. I exist. But what am I? A mind. But what is that? The other thing that stands out about consciousness is that it is definitely a problem, a hard problem. John Searle provides a good starting definition of consciousness in his book, The Mystery of Consciousness, in which he says, quote, Consciousness refers to those states of sentience and awareness that typically begin when we awake from a dreamless sleep and continue until we go to sleep again, or fall into a coma, or die, or otherwise become unconscious, unquote. Consciousness is private, first-person experience. It is the mind, the personal, subjective universe that each person possesses. A place for consciousness is starkly absent from our materialist account of what there is. Let's review. Our universe began with the Big Bang, the rapid expansion of space, complete with all its matter and energy, occurred from a tiny, hot point to become the vastness of its breadth today. Almost immediately upon the birth of our universe, the forces of nature took hold. The strong force holds atomic nuclei together. The weak force controls radioactive decay. The electromagnetic force binds molecular structures together. And gravity draws matter together. As the space expanded, the universe cooled. Atoms, mostly hydrogen and helium, began to form under the power of the strong force matter concentrated to form the galaxies. In the cores of giant stars, thermonuclear fusion created the heavier elements. Those stars went on to explode, scattering the elements across the galaxies. Our sun formed from a cloud of gases enriched with heavier elements, and it came to be orbited by the newborn rocky planet Earth, among others and the Earth turned out to encircle the Sun at an appropriate distance to sustain a high quantity of liquid water. No consciousness in the picture yet, at least I don't think so. We apparently need life for that, complex life. Life apparently began on Earth about three billion years ago as complexes of organic molecules, which is to say molecules including the element carbon, gained the capacity to efficiently replicate and take the form of simple, single-celled organisms. Richard Dawkins writes in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, quote, We have no evidence about what the first step in making life was, but we do know the kind of step it must have been. It must have been whatever it took to get natural selection started. Before that first step, the sorts of improvement that only natural selection can achieve were impossible, and that means the key step was the arising by some process as yet unknown of a self-replicating entity. Self-replication spawns a population of entities which compete with each other to be replicated. Since no copying process is perfect, the population will inevitably come to contain variety. And if variants exist in a population of replicators, those that have what it takes to succeed will come to predominate. This is natural selection and it could not start until the first self-replicating entity came into existence." Unquote. Natural selection, acting on the genetic substrate of these organisms, 
sorted the more adapted among them from the less and awarded the best genes with continuation and proliferation. At this point in the story, it remains hard to find a place for consciousness. Natural selection provides a powerful account for the diversity of life on Earth. Given enough time, enough variation, and enough selection pressure, we end up with immense diversity, and in some organisms, immense complexity. And that includes complexity in the animal nervous system. We understand that consciousness occurs in conjunction with functions in the human brain, so by my reasoning, somewhere along the line, some first set of animals must have begun to exhibit consciousness. But how? We have no way of knowing whether consciousness first occurred way back among the early vertebrate fishes, more recently and only in mammals, just in primates, or only in the human lineage. The most ancient and unsophisticated nervous systems, nerve nets, in jellyfishes, for example, or the simple brains in roundworms, seem highly unlikely to yield anything like consciousness as we know it. It is reasonable to postulate that faster and more complex integrated neuronal networks would have given an advantage to our more recent ancestors. These brain systems would consume huge amounts of energy while conferring a species with a wider range of sensory inputs and behavioral outputs. The resulting flexibility might explain how the human species came to spread and to dominate ecosystems over so much of the planet's surface. But the problem we are faced with, the problem of consciousness, the hard problem, is not to explain how sensory systems process inputs and enable complex adaptive motor outputs. Referring to brain processing, David Chalmers posed the hard problem in his book, The Conscious Mind, as, quote, Why is all this processing accompanied by an experienced inner life? Unquote. There's the rub. Previous and ongoing psychological investigations provide us with the causes and mechanisms of human behavior and personality. In principle, such investigation could account in full for the behavior of individual human organisms. A complete neurobiology could account in full for the neuronal, molecular, and genetic processes that underlie that behavior. But the resulting mechanistic explanation might yield nothing toward the illumination of what I am because I am not a human animal. I am the mind of a human animal. I have my own subjective experiences composed of what philosophers have called qualia. Qualia are the individual qualitative aspects of conscious experiences, the feel of warm water on the fingertips, the blueness of seeing a clear sky, the scent of tobacco smoke, each with its own particular qualities. These are qualia. Clearly the kinds of qualia I perceive my point of view and my destiny are attached to this human animal. Without this human animal, I do not exist. I am less a human animal in possession of consciousness than a conscious mind in association with a human animal. A particular human animal, living in a particular place at a particular time. It seems unnecessary to wonder why I am associated with this human animal rather than another, or at some other place and time. It's strange enough that I exist in association with any living creature at all. So we have reasonable explanations, though incomplete in their details, for the features of our material world. We are provided in the accumulation of these scientific accomplishments with a plausible and useful description of the universe, one that is either objectively true in its details or at least establishes the basis for clarifying those details through further application of empirical methods. We have a plausible understanding of how the human animal comes to live and thrive on Earth. Psychology promises to elaborate on the mechanisms of human perception and behavior, but consciousness remains a mystery. This is the first podcast in an open-ended series. Since the topic at hand is deep and complex, each episode will necessarily build upon the ones that come before. This really can't be done in a linear fashion, but I'll try to begin with the most foundational concepts and build from there. My name is Jesse Winters. I have a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Michigan. But in fact, there is so much to learn that I feel like I'm just getting started. Given the rich history of philosophy and science, I feel like an imposter. But to hell with that. I'm an imposter and so are you and so is every great thinker that ever had a novel thought. Every great thinker who ever laid pen to paper with the courage to spell out a creative idea. We are the beneficiaries of at least two millennia worth of human inspiration and progress.
and never before in our history has the great library of ideas been so close at hand. There are titans in our time standing sentry upon the battlements of human knowledge. In their offices and laboratories, in their lecture halls and on their podcasts, they bravely face the frontier of the unknown. I don't want to replace the old guard. I want to join them on the walls. And I hope this podcast, at least in part, affords me that opportunity. I want to be an integral part of answering the most difficult question ever posed. What is consciousness? How can an objective world produce subjective experiences? My intuition is that in the abundance of philosophical ideas that have been explored over the centuries, in the principles of mathematics, in the experimental data that have been accrued in biology, together with advancements in theoretical physics, and perhaps most importantly, the theories coming out of cognitive neuroscience, the puzzle pieces necessary to gain purchase on the hard problem, though scattered in the literature and in the minds of thinkers in a hundred fields of study, are there to be assembled. There are certainly missing pieces, but with some creative thinking, I believe we can put a lot of them together. Consciousness is a real thing with describable properties, and it calls out for an explanation. And I, your humble host, am endeavoring to work it out. I was never really taught to theorize in my scientific education. Maybe that's not something you can be taught. Francois Jacob described this kind of work as night science. In his autobiography, The Statue Within, he wrote, quote, Night science is a sort of workshop of the possible, where what will become of the building material of science is worked out, where phenomena are still more solitary of events with no link between them, where thought makes its way along meandering paths and twisting lanes, most often leading nowhere. What guides the mind, then, is not logic, but instinct, intuition, the need to understand." Unquote. In my experience, there is a large measure of creative thinking needed to produce a theory. But a critical mass of knowledge in both research methodology and in existing lines of evidence is necessary if the theory is to be of any use and not merely uninformed speculation. I recognize a degree of hubris in this undertaking, but please understand that I am not claiming to know everything. In fact, I have, if I have learned anything at all, it is how little I know. If no one ever hears this recording, I will still consider it to have been worthwhile. The podcast affords me an opportunity to organize and present my thoughts, and if you are listening, I appreciate your thoughtful attention, and I hope you find it worth your while. Science, especially theoretical science, can be an isolating exercise. You might expect that at our finest research universities, brilliant men and women from a range of disciplines would gather for riveting dialectics on important topics of intellectual interest, but if they do, I've never been invited to the party. So if you feel like you're engaged in your own private university, trying to make sense of great works of writing and listening in on intellectual com conversations online, I can tell you that I am on the inside of the scientific community, whatever that means, and I'm doing the same thing you are. And puzzle pieces keep revealing themselves to me everywhere I look. This podcast, then, is my attempt to start assembling the puzzle into a robust theory of consciousness. I routinely hear great intellectuals declare some version of the statement, we do not know anything about consciousness. The mystery is so great that it enables wild speculation. I believe we can now begin to separate the wheat from the chaff. But I don't intend to do this alone. There is way too much that I don't know or understand, that I've never thought about, or that I am blind to. Today I'd like to get started by laying out some assumptions that underlie my thinking on consciousness. Sticking to the puzzle analogy, I will try to establish a border by laying down some edge pieces. My first assumption is that there is a material world which physics can be used to describe in objective terms. All of empirical science necessarily rests on this assumption. Unless you are of a particularly contrarian nature, I suspect that you are willing to go along with this, at least for the sake of discussion. There is a view in metaphysics called idealism which espouses that the fundamental nature of reality is mental, not physical. René Descartes, in his Discourse on Method, wrote, quote, When I considered that the very same thoughts we experienced when awake may also be experienced when we are asleep, 
While there is at that time not one of them true, I suppose that all the objects that had ever entered my mind when awake had in them no more truth than the illusions of my dreams. But immediately upon this I observed that whilst I thus wished to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I who thus thought should be somewhat. And as I observed that this truth, I think hence I am, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt however extravagant, could be alleged by the skeptics capable of shaking it. I concluded that I might, without scruple, accept it as the first principle of the philosophy of which I was in search." Unquote. This line of reasoning, taken to the extreme, could result in doubting just about everything. That is why my assumption that there is a material world is an assumption. I am sympathetic to Descartes' thinking here, as will be evident in my second assumption. My second assumption is that I exist and that I am identical to my mind. This relates to the observation that Descartes made. In his meditations, Descartes writes, quote, I am, I exist, this is certain, but how often? As often as I think, for perhaps it would even happen if I should wholly cease to think that I should at the same time altogether cease to be, unquote. Here, Descartes refers to thinking in a broad sense as anything at all occurring in the mind. Strangely, using the same reasoning as Descartes, I cannot establish that he did exist, but I can know that I exist. In that sense, this for me is less of an assumption. But if you are listening to this, you will have to take my consciousness as an assumption, and I am willing to return the favor in my third assumption. My third assumption is that other conscious beings exist, that is, other people are not all non-conscious zombies or non-player characters in my world. At this point, we cannot make any particular assertions about which animals are possessed of subjective experiences, but we can at least make the assumption that human beings, awake and walking around and interacting with the world, are conscious. For what it's worth, I suspect that animals with complex nervous systems similar in structure to those of humans also enjoy subjective experiences. What those experiences are like for those animals is another question altogether. This is important to consider as we attempt to construct a theory of consciousness. Undoubtedly, there are features of human conscious experience that are, that are reflective of evolved human tendencies and human cognitive capacities. Those human specializations might be neither necessary nor sufficient for consciousness per se. So to review, my first three starting assumptions are the objective world exists, I exist, and you exist. If we can accept that, then let's move on to two further starting assumptions. Assumption number four is that the brain contains the physical substrate for consciousness. That is, human consciousness occurs because of processes taking place in the brain. My mind arises from activities in this brain, your mind arises from activities in that brain. If we dose you up with a general anesthetic, your brain will be unable to sustain those activities, and your mind, you, will cease to exist. Likewise, if we squash your brain in a vice. Here, I am ruling out the brain acting as some kind of antenna, the activities of which are necessary for connection between the human body and the mind which is actually situated in some far-off realm. And this assumption disregards the possibility that the brain only seems to be the source of consciousness because of something we don't know. Suppose, for example, that you are, in fact, a strange creature somewhere plugged into a simulation that is our universe. In such a case, the human organism that it seems to you that you are is actually a kind of avatar in a virtual world. The strange creature that is the real you might not have a brain. Maybe brains aren't even a thing outside of the simulation. Such a case would also violate my first assumption, and it would invalidate everything ever discovered by scientific means. Hell with that. Human consciousness comes from the human brain, and that's that. For this discussion, my final assumption is that all chemistry and biology reduce to physics. The brain is a material apparatus, and it exists in an objective world and carries out objective functions. There is no animating spirit communing with the brain or any call for supernatural explanations. To borrow a term from Gilbert Ryle, there is no ghost in the machine. 
Therefore, consciousness is an emergent property of physical processes. Does this entail that consciousness is reducible to physics? I think it does. Patricia Churchland in her book Neurophilosophy says, quote, Inevitably, the naturalistic approach leads us to inquire into the possibility of a unified theory of the mind-brain, wherein psychological states and processes are explained in terms of neuronal states and processes. A fundamental question concerning this possibility can be put as follows. Can mental states and processes be reduced to brain states and processes? Can one be a reductionist? Not everyone expects mental states to reduce to brain states. On the contrary, it has been my observation that many philosophers and cognitive scientists, most of the artificial intelligentsia, not a few neuroscientists and biologists, and theologians generally, reject the possibility as unlikely, and not merely as unlikely, but as flatly preposterous." Unquote. In Churchland's discussion of intertheoretic reduction, she describes reduction as a relation between two theories, such that one phenomenon reduces to the other in the reduction of the two theories. One result of this reduction is ontological simplification, in which what are thought to be two distinct phenomena are afterwards understood as one phenomenon described by two different theories. Churchland divides the skeptics of the reduction of consciousness into two groups. The first group are the substance dualists, who claim that there is a mental realm and a separate physical realm. In such a case, neither can be reduced to the other. The second group are the property dualists, who hold that subjective experiences are produced by the brain but are not identifiable with any physical property of the brain. Qualia in this view are emergent from physical processes. I tend to agree, in general, with this latter view, but I am not convinced that an emergent property is irreducible. This seems a bit like a conceptual sleight of hand. Isn't flight an emergent property of having effective wings? But flight can fully be explained in physical terms. In my opinion, a robust theory of consciousness will undergo intertheoretic reduction to a unified theory in physics and thereby solve the hard problem. So, to review, I assume that the material world exists, that I exist, that other conscious beings exist, that consciousness arises from the brain, and that it does so by physical means. So accepting those assumptions, we can begin our approach to determining the physical explanation for consciousness. How do subjective points of view exist with respect to the objective material world? When I was young and my friends and I would engage in long conversations about deep topics, the problem of consciousness really stuck with me. At the time, I was unmotivated by school. I barely graduated from high school, really. I went to community college because that seemed like the thing to do, and I really didn't have a long-term plan. Before long, my best friends went their separate ways into the military or technical college or whatever. I was lucky enough to take an introductory course in psychology with a really great instructor. I don't remember his name, but he taught me to begin to think skeptically, to value evidence and empirical methods. Eventually, I transferred to a four-year university and majored in biology, a subject about which I had essentially no prior education. I worked as a research technician in two different labs and began to learn what it is like to actually conduct research. It took a long time to get to graduate school and study neuroscience, and when I did, I had the great privilege of attending one of the best programs in the country. In graduate school, I studied a component of the voltage-gated sodium channel, we end up becoming experts in the very fine details at the edge of a single, often esoteric, field of science. I wanted to know what to do next, how to get out of the rootlets of the roots of the one tree into which I had borrowed and back out into the view of the forest. I wrote an email to Christoph Koch and asked him for advice on getting into the consciousness game. I didn't hear back from him for a really long time. But I decided I'd had enough of molecular neuroscience, that I wanted to learn more about circuit-level neuronal activities and cognition. My PhD mentor had a tradition of getting a book for us as a parting gift each time a graduate student attains their PhD. I asked for The Quest for Consciousness by Christoph Koch. 
After my dissertation defense, I joined a lab that would allow me to conduct extracellular recordings. And that's what I'm doing now in the lab. I eventually did hear back from Kristoff. I'm not sure how it came about, but it was like a year later. He told me that the best lab to go to for postdoctoral work was that of Giulio Tononi. In 2018, I met Giulio in Venice, Italy at a week-long course on the neuroscientific study of consciousness. That's where I met some of the luminaries in the consciousness field and where I first learned in detail about integrated information theory. Since then, I've been reinvesting in my own quest for consciousness. That pursuit has become my night science. I started collecting puzzle pieces and trying to arrange them into a coherent picture. Last year, I submitted a manuscript to a peer-reviewed journal. It lays out a new theoretical framework for consciousness. It's been in review for quite a while, and I expect it to be published. I'm its sole author. If you keep listening, I'll tell you about it in a later podcast. This is just the beginning.